talking with M.T. Connolly, uh, who has a book out called The Measure of Our Age. A really interesting topic, at least I find it to be really interesting. Uh, M.T., let's, let's set the stage a little bit about who you are and then get into the meat of what you're so knowledgeable about. Uh, you live in Washington, D.C. You've had jobs both in government and out, policymaking, lawyering, uh, all, uh, working in the Justice Department, all different kinds of uh, interesting roles. And uh, I, I see you went to some pretty good schools too. Uh, yes, I guess I was uh, I was fortunate to go to places that educated me well. I hope. And did you grow up in that area, Washington? I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. I grew up in the Midwest, even though I've sort of hugged the coast since then. You know what cold feels like. I do. Yes. Yes. And snow. Lots of snow. Um, <laughs> at least back then. There's less of it now. So the good schools we're talking about, you went to uh, Stanford undergrad, and then you went to Northeastern for your for law school. So great education. Uh, Rochester, Minnesota, you said, let me go get educated on the West Coast and come back and finish my education on the East Coast. So uh, yeah, I'd say you've done a good job of avoiding the Midwest ever since. <laughs> Although I do have great allegiance to the Midwest. I love Minnesota and Wisconsin and have, as you saw, I start the book on a river in northern Wisconsin. I, I have great love for that part of the country. I think it's really beautiful. Really, really good people. Yeah, I feel very fortunate. I go back a lot. I have a couple of siblings who still live in Minnesota and lots of friends. So um, I I have roots in that part of the country still. My wife and I have a place down in Naples, Florida. And unlike the east coast of Florida, Naples is heavily populated by Midwesterners. And I described to my northeastern friends, I said, you know, we love to walk on a beach and these Midwesterners do these really strange things. Like when you pass them, they say, hello, <laughs> people. <laughs> it's sad that that's the exception rather than the rule, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> I did a clerkship, a judicial clerkship in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. For... Oh, did How did you get interested in this body of work looking at the impact, uh, uh, especially you started out on the uh, legal side of things, discovering that there was a lot of uh, elder care, elder abuse uh, in the system. And, and as you report, up to 96% of all the abuse that takes place each year in the United States goes unreported. How did you become sensitive to this issue? And, and it, it seems to me like you've made it your life's work to try and do something about it. I started off, as you said, as a lawyer at the Department of Justice and, and really launched something that we called the Nurse Initiative and then changed the name to the Elder Justice Initiative. And that focused on problems in nursing homes, on abuse and neglect, and also fraud in nursing homes. And when I first started to get to know, you know, first learn about the problem, I thought, oh, this is a terrible new problem. And the more I dug into it, the more I understood it wasn't a new problem at all that had been going on for a very long time and um, is related to all sorts of um, structural issues. But what the upshot is that the very vulnerable people who live in nursing homes and often who call nursing homes home, get the care they need um, and that they deserve. Um, so that's really what got me started. And I initially thought, look to the law for answers. I, we prosecuted some nursing home chains and we, um, you know, we, we looked at how we might tweak the law. And then I went over to the Senate and worked with them on something called the Elder Justice Act. Um, but what I learned was that those, we made some progress, but those were not silver bullets. And I was disappointed that the problems that I that had sort of launched me work persisted. Um, so that's really what led me to write the book, because I wanted to understand at a deeper level what was going on here. Why is it that as a society, we tolerate seriously substandard care for some of the most vulnerable citizens? And, you know, unlike on the other issues that divide us, we are all aging. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. There's no exceptions, huh? Are, race, ethnicity, political affiliation, geography, we're all moving through time together. And we probably all have somebody we love or care about or for who's an older person too. And we're all older people in training if we're not there already. So <laughs> I wanted to understand at a deeper level what was going on. 
the elder care problem, the elder uh, circumstance, how has that changed over the generations? I grew up in uh, in the New York in New York City. There were many many families. We grew up in a working class blue collar neighborhood. There were many multi generational family households. Uh, we didn't know anyone who ever wound up in a nursing home. And in the course of my lifetime, that's changed. It's such an important point, Jim. So there are several changes. Um, and one, as you just alluded to, is that we're really, as a society, very segregated by age now. Um, and the models that we have for aging are largely either isolation, people want to stay in their own homes and often get very isolated sure. there age segregation, that we live in places that are populated by older people. And that's, you know, I love older people. And, and th that is one kind of community. But there's also a loss when we don't have more intergenerational um, contact, you know, because it impoverishes our our social environment and our imagination. Um, and I think that's a it's an important, if sometimes invisible loss. Another thing that's going on um, is that as a society, we're living longer, right? We have, in 1900, we lived an average of 38 years as Americans, and by 2000, and actually still today, we live an average of 78 years. That's a lot of, um, you know, lengthening of life. What was the age at 1900? Life expectancy? 38. 38. Yeah, so 38 to 78. You know, a lot of that has to do with reducing childhood mortality and, you know, deaths and childbirth and that sort of thing. But we've also learned how to extend life. But the life expectancy is 78, whereas the healthy life expectancy is 66. And it's lower for people of color, people who don't have good health care, who are experiencing poverty or don't have education. And so um, about three quarters of people 85 and older have some sort of functional disability. That means a lot more people need care today than ever before. You know, in mm. a sense, we have this victory of longevity, but we're good at the quantity part. We extended lives, but we've done less well at the quality of part of assuring the quality of life. And so and we really don't have a coherent care system. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more about that. But we don't have good long-term care options, and we don't have good ways to pay for it. And that is has a profound impact on the quality of life of older, not just older people, but families and everyone, really. If I recall, it, when uh, Roosevelt introduced Social Security system, I, I think he set the retirement age at 65, which is what it still is uh, from a Social Security point of view. But I think our life expectancy back when he introduced that was 62. Tens of millions of people, 65 plus, wanting to collect their Social Security in a system that was designed not to pay out that much <laughs> because you weren't expected to live that long. Right. That's I think that's an important factor. And another one is that, you know, we kind of think about work going till 65, period. But for many people, they have another one, two, three decades of potentially productive life. And we don't have great off ramps from full time work. You know, many people still have a lot to give. And there, God knows, there's a lot of need in society that older people could really help to meet. And so I think one of the this again is I think that our imagination and customs and norms as a culture have not kept up with longevity, that we don't have great opportunities. I mean, a lot of people figure it out, um, but, you know, it's not the norm to say, OK, you know, do you want to think about maybe winding down and hear an array of possibilities that could be open to you. You know, some might be paid, some might be volunteers, some might be in the work that you've been doing for your entire career. Some might be something completely new. Um, you know, David Brooks just wrote a piece for the Atlantic Magazine about the encore phase and how a lot of people are, you know, thinking about it as as uh, this go back to college, you know, direct a play, um, do something else. So in any event, it's uh, I think it's it's a it's an exciting challenge to think more productively about what we might do as we age in this additional chapter of life. We've gotten to know a lady by the name of Cynthia 
Covey Heller, and she wrote a uh, she wrote a book called Living Life in Crescendo. And the premise of the book is very much what you're saying and what you say David Brooks is writing and thinking about. And that is, it's a lot about attitude. And look, if you're a, a ditch digger, 65 retirement sounds very attractive. But if you get to work in the knowledge economy, the idea of you're in good health, the idea you should retire and uproot yourself and move to a warmer place, I think it's, I think it's being challenged by a lot of people, uh, the whole concept. And I worry about the things that you're concerned about, too, and that is isolation and the impact of decisions we make vis-a-vis -vis retirement, where we choose to live, of being around our families, the consequences from a mental health perspective uh, of those decisions, because I think there are lots of lonely older people. And I think we should be conscious of our, our inputs and how we keep socially involved and active and being conscious of it, uh, I've, I've said on this show a few times that even in our life uh, here in uh, Long Island, my wife and I are conscious of the fact that our circle of friends is changing. Some of them are moving to Florida full time. If they go to the East Coast, <laughs> we're not likely to see a lot of them again. And uh, the ability to call up a couple of different uh, folks and say, hey, let's let's go grab some uh, great Italian food at, uh, at DiMaggio's on Friday night. It's a uh, your circle narrows naturally. Uh, health, divorce, disability, death, geography. And you have to be, we have to be conscious of uh, maintaining and growing our social circles uh, because uh, if you're not conscious of it, it's going to narrow and all of a sudden you realize, I just don't have the network I used to have. What you're pointing out is critically important. And so as we age and change and our circumstances change, as you said, it's a really important thing to be aware of. And it's another reason for intergenerational friendships and communities. And there are things called age-friendly communities that I that I wrote a little bit about that really yes. try to take into consideration how to make communities good places for everybody, people of every yeah. age. And that, you know, in 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 part we want to be alone, in part we want to be together with other people and to have the opportunities for both of those. Um, but as you said, as you point out, as we age, the command performance, I think of it as the command performances of life, you know, mm -hmm. school and work um, and that sort of thing become less demanding for many people, not for everybody. And, um, and so we have to make sure that we don't get isolated and lonely because those are not they have not just an impact on our physical health i mean on our mental health but also on our physical health and also make us more vulnerable to being exploited and abused actually the the data are that social um social support or in connection are is the antidote to much of what might ail us and so to keep track of that is really critical so let's delve into the things that you uh shock us all with in, in terms of your reporting in the book, The Measure of Our Age. Tell us about what is the abuse situation? Take us to the macro picture. How serious is it? How common is it? Alas, it's much more common than people want to contemplate. About one in 10 people 60 and older is abused, exploited, or neglected. That can take a lot of different forms. Probably the most common one that all over the place, but is financial exploitation. And you know, we all know that we're being targeted increasingly for money and um, scammers target older people because that's often where the money is, but also because they're relying on something that is described in different ways, but it's like sort of a decline in financial capacity where you might be more trusting, you might be making, or I might be making decisions that are a little bit less careful about my money, or, you know, there might be some kind of um, cognitive decline that doesn't present itself in any other way, except for that you start making decisions that are riskier and the money can be gone all at once very suddenly. So that's one form. Another problem that we underestimate is the the harm of verbal abuse. There's a lot of ageism in society. And I'm not talking about just, you know, an offhand comment here or there, but, you know, screaming and yelling, and that can be very detrimental to people. And neglect, as, as we started off the conversation with, in facilities is very common and very serious. Many, many care 
facilities are understaffed. Staffing is the most critical factor in good care, although there are a lot of other factors too. And people can, as you as you saw, I wrote, people can get neglected at home as well. So there's a lot to be concerned about, but also, and nobody really wants to think about it or read about it is the truth. There's also great potential to um, put prevention, put preventive measures in place that I think we're not aware of enough. The book is to help people understand what are some of the challenges that are out there and what are some ways that we can you know, think about protecting ourselves better. As we think about the, the ways that you put forth, the suggestions you have, the things that you try to uh, weave into our legislation to, to protect people, let's talk about the two big factors there is numbers of people. There's, we're aging as a population. We have the baby boomers now turning into seniors. And give us some of the numbers on that. How big a population is the 65 plus community? Baby boomers as a cohort were about 77 million and there are some fewer now, but in terms of numbers of people with dementia, that's about 6 million. And actually, one of the numbers that I find most striking is going back to the caregiving, you know, and the people need more, more people needing more care than ever before. Because we don't really have a coherent long term care system, people don't want to go to facilities, they want to stay at home. And there's really, it's very expensive, you know, with Medicare doesn't pay for. Um, long-term care and most health insurance plans don't. And most people don't have long-term care insurance and even, and it's very expensive. And even when they do, it often doesn't cover what they need when they need it. And so that means that we've got about 50 million people called informal care. That's bigger than the population of California. That's a lot of people. And it's not just like a little bit of care. It's an average of 24 hours a week for an average of four years. And so what we see is a ripple effect in the labor force, in their own income, in the health and well-being of those caregivers. And one reason for that is that we have not done a good job supporting them at all. It's a very invisible kind of job, even though, I mean, any workforce of 50 million people, it's just a, you know, that's huge. Let's look at the other side of it. That's that's the numbers. That's yeah. fascinating. And talk about the economics of that now. You have the greatest generational wealth transfer taking place now. And while we talk about how wealthy and how uh, much of that wealth is going to be transferred on to the next generation or or not. And then there's the other side of it. People who didn't plan well enough or weren't fortunate enough who outlived their resources. That's right. And actually, in terms of that wealth transfer, Caregiving plays an important role. I think of a show economy that we don't really pay attention to. Um, the estimated value of that informal or unpaid care is about five hundred billion dollars a year, or more than wow. that. You know, half a trillion dollars. And the estimated losses to those caregivers is not surprisingly also about a half a trillion dollars a year. So losses in income and in other sorts of costs. So. Um, we're not doing honest math about the cost. And then they too, because we have so little support and the work can be very arduous, you know, we're not doing honest math either in terms of the consequences to those caregivers in terms of their own health and financial circumstances. And what it does is it interrupts that ability to pass along that what you're talking about, that wealth transfer. So for yep. people who are less well off, who have had, you know, who don't have sort of the same kinds of pensions or health, you know, health insurance opportunities or whatever kind of coverage, there's an enormous drain economically often and a lack of opportunity to get ahead that sort of compounds itself in part because of longevity and that we're also not really talking about. And then there's the whole, um, you know, there are the economics of the systems that we do have. So there are about $181 billion a year that go to nursing homes and what are called CCRCs, Continuing Care Retirement Communities, of uh -huh. which more than $100 billion are public dollars. And we don't really wow. know how those $100 billion are being spent. You know? yep. But we do know that staffing is the most important element, and not just how much we pay staff, but also how well they're trained, how well they're supervised, how much meaning they find in their work. 
whether there's a churn, you know, if you're constantly turning over staff in a facility, it interrupts the ability to form relationships. And those places are people's homes. So it's tremendously important also to have consistency. So we don't know how 100 billion bucks in <laughs> public dollars are being spent. And in the meantime, you know, there's a great wailing and gnashing of teeth about the lack of quality. So I think that in many ways is not good stewardship over public funds. You know, one thing I uh, had an idea to do, and we haven't done, but I wonder what you think of the idea. Here on Long Island, uh, as there are so many places, uh, senior communities, 55 plus, all these aggregation of seniors. And I, we have a charity called Smile Farms, where we uh, create work environments and training uh, uh, environments for adults with uh, developmental disabilities, all kinds of disabilities, but primarily developmental disabilities. Uh, I have a younger brother who's one of those workers at one of our farm facilities, Smile Farm. So we build greenhouses and they grow flowers and plants and, and now foodstuffs. And I always thought, why don't we build one of those just next door or even in a retirement community because you have all these talented and nice people. And I, I just suspect that the, their interest in volunteering and helping out in different ways would be enormous. And I, I love the, the idea of people with one need helping people with other kinds of needs. It's such a fabulous idea, Jim, and I, I hope you do it. There's a, you know, the, the name for what you're talking about is co-location, where you put um, entities that are designed for people who have different sorts of needs, you know, adjacent, there's a multiplier effect, or like a child care center with assisted living, or, you know, shared activism of older and younger people. There's a guy named Mark Friedman who runs an operate, who's a co-CEO of a place called Co-Generate, who really is very focused on the shared activism of older and younger people. There's so much, um, it's not just a, a need based, but also a mentoring based, as, as you just said, you know, there's, there's so much to learn or older people reading to kids. I, I think it's that the lost capacity um, and benefit. I mean, we know that there's huge benefit to the people involved too, when they have those kinds of opportunities. And interestingly, there's been a little bit of research on it. And the, the data are that people love the idea. They love the idea of co-location. And yet there are both, I think, bureaucratic and cultural impediments, not insurmountable ones, but we just make it not easy to do. It's not the default. And there are like there, who knows what kinds of rules or regulations that you have to navigate. But I I think it's a really, really important and hopeful thing that we can and should be doing much more of. In my first career, I was in the social services. I ran a home for teenage boys and group homes. We had group homes and I lived in and worked in the group homes in the earliest part of my career. And the best part of being in a group home was that you were in a community, you were part of a community. And I remember there were several people in each of the group homes I worked in who lived nearby, who took an interest in uh, my guys, you know, one or two of them in particular, and they got connected and they developed real and good and uh, beneficial relationships. And didn't think of it until you said it about the uh, age isolation that we're inadvertently uh, promote in in terms of how we live here in this country i think it's a i think it's a great point that uh, i always wanted to move a group home into a senior facility because i you have all the you know you don't want to overwhelm it you want the right balance but you have all these wonderful people who are caring thoughtful have time and interest who could uh, volunteer and interact and come over for dinner and a barbecue Exactly right. You know, as, as I wrote about in the prologue of the book, a really formative of, um, experience in my life was living on a general admission psych ward as what was called a resident volunteer. I was 19 years old and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life. So I took a year off of college and general admission psych ward, you know, back in the days when we had these big um, psychiatric hospitals. And, yes. you know, there was a lot that was wrong with it, but there was also a lot that was right about it. It was a community of people, uh, you know, both the patients and the staff were my friends. I learned so much from all of them. We went on outings. We did, you know, we had softball games. We would go to the theater together. I mean, there was like all kinds of stuff. And it was really, 
you need to be in community with other people to see them as human beings. Um, and that's one of the problems with our age segregation is not seeing older people as human beings. And that makes aging scary and alien and, and other. And that's a, that's a really huge cultural loss that's going to, I think, afflict us for decades to come. I love your what you did. That it sounds similar to what I did. Only I turned it into a my first career. Uh, it was something I did just because it seemed interesting to do. And I, I I'm going to guess that you would agree with me that it would be a good idea if this country would have a program of one year of service for every young person, whether it's in the military or it's uh, working in a, a a psych ward or it's a, a Teach for America or it's a conservation corps. I just think the idea of getting out of your little world, being with other people of different economic, social, and uh, circumstance, being with different people from all over just helps us grow, mature, and have a sensitivity, because I think we live in more and more isolated environments. I could not agree more. And um, actually, I just heard Governor Wes Moore, who's the relatively newly elected governor in Maryland, speak, and he has. He's amazing. He's amazing. I was just sort of gobsmacked by him. But among many other things, he has started a year of service. Um, pro, uh, he has started a program, legislated. He just, I, if I'm, you check me on this, but I believe they just signed it into law. Um, and they have a year of service for young, option for young people. And, you know, it's it's also we need, you know, we need to learn an ethos of serving. We are in community with other human beings. And, you know, we've become a, a, a sometimes more selfish people. And, um, but, you know, if, even if you want to look at it selfishly, it's not only good for the people that you're serving, it's good for you. It's good for us. No question. I think about mostly the benefit to the individual, not the, the people they're serving. And again, it's a health, I mean, it's an actual health benefit as well as a mental health benefit. The last chapter of my book, which uh, focuses on this and really transformed my thinking about um, what is important, not only as we age, but throughout life. And it mm -hmm. helped me create another filter for what I think about in terms of how I spend my own time and what I advocate for. Because I think having a sense of purpose and being able to contribute to other people, it has these, um, has much more profound health benefits. It has health benefits to the person who's volunteering or doing the contributing that are equivalent to stopping smoking or getting exercise or getting enough sleep. And we don't even, we don't understand that, but it goes back to something I think that you were talking about too, which is our, our mindset. Like what we pay attention to determines our existence. That is, that it's sacred. And so, um, so there's so much more we can do inside our own lives and in our own heads, I think, to be healthier and happier people that we really underestimate um, and that we could take much more control over. I'm, I'm still struck by the uh, difference between our average uh, life expectancy and our average good health expectancy. Uh, was, was that an eight-year gap you mentioned? Yes, 66 to 78. Wow, okay. So uh, that's daunting to think about that we have... Uh, these tens of millions of people uh, hitting uh, hitting retirement age now that are baby boomers. And we all think about our life expectancy and all that we're doing to make sure we live longer and healthier lives. But it's irrefutable, as you say, uh, that you can't count on that, that you can't count on dying at the life expectancy age or beyond in good health until your last day. That's right. I mean, I think we have some, a mirage and I get it. You know, it's 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 very appealing to think, you're going to, you know, you're going to be healthy, 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 and then boom, and then you die and it, no problem. It's really one of, another one of the reasons I wrote the book is because if we pay attention, it's not, there are no silver bullets, obviously, but we can improve our odds as in any kind of any aspect of life. We can improve our odds of a better old age by taking certain steps and going into it more knowledgeably, planning better, thinking about who we trust who we want to make sure we stay in touch with. I mean, it- How we plan. Yeah, how we plan financially, but also as you were pointing out, 
in terms of staying connected to other people, what kind of activity we want to fill our days with. I mean, there's also this, I mean, there's a, it, it's, it's an opportunity. Old, older age is also an opportunity for, you know, um, exploring new things to, you know, creativity and curiosity. Um, and also for telling stories, um, you know, you're engaged in the business storytelling as a podcaster. Um, Dave Isay, who runs StoryCorps, also encourages younger people to want to hear the stories of older people. And, um, and you know, it's there's no lack of stories. There's just a lack of curiosity about them and asking them. And that, too, is a really profound act, I think, um, of listening to another person's story, because often changes us. We, you know, we learn important things. MT, we have a, a brand in the, in the flowers group here that's called Harry and David. Wonderful food products, uh, uh, 5,000 acres of agricultural production in Southwest Oregon. It's a, a wonderful company. And they have good and thoughtful, caring people at the Harry and David company. And their focus as a team has been on supporting the caregiver community. Would you have any uh, uh, thoughts and ideas about how we as a company, as a people, as uh, individuals can can help support that caregiver community, whether they're caring for someone who's older, whether they're caring for a disabled child, perhaps a neighbor uh, or, or a grandchild? You know, so many of us are at least part time caregivers. What thoughts do you have on how we can be more supportive of that very important caregiver community? Well, first, I didn't know that that you were affiliated with Harry and David. I've been a, a a very loyal consumer for many years, and you know, have sent those gift boxes to countless people. So um, happy to so hear that <laughs> you bailed me out at the last minute when I couldn't think of what other gift to give somebody. So, um, and I love that you are paying attention to um, to the issue of caregiving. I think one one thing is that I view care. It shouldn't be a solo endeavor, um, and we should think about it as a as a team sport. You know, I was really fortunate that my sister was in the same town as my father, and my brother was ninety miles away in Minnesota. I was, you know, I was one of the backbenchers on the on the coasts, and yep. um, and we were incredibly fortunate. And I wish I would have done even more to you know to help them. So I think. Yes. Um, I think to tell caregivers that they need to build a team, they shouldn't just do it alone. And it isn't ever only one person's responsibility. And I think uh, vocabulary matters here too, MT. I think we, we need to, as a society, not think of caregiving as a burden. That oftentimes it's a, an opportunity, it's a, it's a calling, it's their, their chance to say thank you and give back. I totally agree with that as long as it doesn't tip over into being too much, because also as a society, we're really not helping caregivers. And some, you know, sometimes I agree, it's a really beautiful calling. And other times people are running the equivalent of a pop-up intensive care unit in their living rooms while they're trying yep. to, you know, educate their kids or help, you know, their kids go to school and they're trying to take care of a parent and nobody is helping them. And so I think, it's a yes and. Um, I think we need to honor the work that is part of caregiving, whether it's child care or elder care um, or care for people with disabilities or just making sure we stay in touch. Right? That it's, it's something that we honor. I think we need to honor it more as part of the essential fabric of a healthy society. Um, and part of that is actually doing a much better job in caring for caregivers, in providing them training and resources and flexibility in terms of time at work. Yes, absolutely. I think it's something that that um, workplaces are only just now beginning to embrace more. I mean, w workplaces have always dealt with um, child care or haven't always dealt with it well, but but elder care is increasingly a huge component of workers' lives. And also something called respite care, you know, giving the um, it, and also I believe that the, the line between informal care and caregiving 
by paid caregivers is often a blurry one. People move in and out of both being a provider of care and a consumer of care, um, and that we need to tr treat paid caregivers much better than we do. I mean, like teachers, like health professionals, um, caregiving, um, whether you're a, a, a certified nurse's aide or a, you know, a personal care aide, we don't treat those people very well as a society. We don't pay them well, don't train them well, don't do, even though the economy depends on them, right? We are, yep. we go to work because we have a care economy, whether That's whoever right. it is. And so I think we need to shift our understanding of how we think about infrastructure, <laughs> economic infrastructure, actually, um, in terms of raising up that work and acknowledging it and either compensating it as it deserves to be compensated and or providing the assistance in the informal care setting that people need often so that it doesn't become overwhelming, so that it is, you know, because um, we're expecting people to do more and more and more and women who shoulder most of the care, not all obviously, but a good uh, but disproportionate share are also increasingly, you know, in the workplace and are trying to balance all of that. So. Yes, and is my answer. And I think the one of the ends that I would add is I bet just getting to know you in our discussion here, I bet that you were quick to recognize, acknowledge, and thank your sister and your brother 90 miles away for that for them doing the right thing and, and taking care of your dad. I bet you thank them and I bet you acknowledge that. And uh, I think that's something that we can all do, whether it's whether we're in, indirectly to beneficiaries or we just know of a friend who's just an extraordinarily good person and, and is playing a caregiver role in someone else's life. Just acknowledging it and saying that you recognize it and you so admire it uh, would mean a lot to a lot of people who probably don't get recognized as much as they should. I agree. And also saying, what do you need? What can I do to help? That's a really important part, too, because a lot of people go into by default of geography or proximity, or they're not the person with a complicated work schedule, even though they're doing very real and very important work. And so sometimes the entire burden or a very disproportionate burden of it, and, and perhaps I think I, I take your note that maybe the burden isn't the right word in many circumstances, but a disproportionate quantity of the work falls on one person. And then that's just the default and that becomes invisible in its own way. And so I think yes. also saying, what do you need? What can we do? I do, we do to help. And maybe that's calling, you know, fighting with insurance companies or arranging for, you know, somebody else to come in or figuring out the doctor's offices or, you know, there, there's certainly enough work to go around. So I think it, it needs to be a team sport. MT, you've uh, spent the better part of your uh, professional life uh, devoted to this, uh, to this subject. It's in our time together today, we've barely been able to peel back the onion on all the different facets of it. And that's why you have this wonderful book, over 300 pages, The Measure of Our Age by you, MT Connolly. Uh, interesting read. I think, uh, more importantly, I, th I think your book and your advocacy will create a lot of different conversations around all of these different elements and and do good for all. And and we look forward to watching you successfully advocate for change that would be beneficial uh, to this community of people because it be us very soon. <laughs> and now we're all moving through time together. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate Thanks, yeah. your interest and for you know promoting these important questions. Thanks, MT. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thanks for having me.